champs is back. Listen up, this is the anthem track. This is history in the making. You're all witnessing greatness. It's better when the pressure is on us. Our backs against the wall. What we do get stronger. And everything we earn, we deserve. It's nothing but blood, sweat, tears, and hard work on our turf. Still on top, we stay focused. Been running it for a minute now. If you ain't noticed, cause now is our time. It's all or nothing. So pay attention, cause them boys is up to something. From the proven grounds to top tier, we won't stop. And they still mad, cause we still here. Fre Welcome to episode 26 of the Foxborough Fellas podcast. I am joined by my co-host, Avish, per usual. Today, we have a very special guest, Jeremiah Holloway, UNC basketball and football reporter for Inside Carolina, the leading news source for UNC sports and the largest online community of Tar Heel fans. Today, you guessed it, we are discussing Drake May, the third overall pick in the 2024 draft by your New England Patriots. But before we get into all of that, Boys, how we feeling? I'm feeling good. Feeling, you know, blessed to be here. Excited to, you know, talk to you guys, you know, chop it up with y'all, talk some football, talk some NFL. Uh, kind of funny for me watching these, uh, you know, Patriots highlights to start. I actually grew up a, a, a Ravens fan, so, you know, that's a little interesting. But, uh, you know, some good battles over the years for sure. But, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm good to go, man. I'm, I'm doing well. Devish? I'm doing well as well, man. I... I mean, I knew in advance that we were going to have like a fellow ACC fan. So I'm representing my, I'm in my ACC gear too, representing Georgia Tech. <laughs> uh, I'm excited for ACC pool play to start next week in baseball. Uh, we've been doing well. Like, I mean, not like North Carolina well, but like well, then like better than we expected to do. <laughs> so I'm excited to see how uh, the ACC pool play goes and like most likely looks like we're going to make it to the tournament too. So I'm excited. Maybe we play North Carolina in the tournament. I don't know how regional is going to shape out, but I'm excited. We have three ACC fans in the house. I'm a Boston College fan. You got over there, Ravens fan. You got my boy Zay Flowers over there. <laughs> yeah. uh, shout out yeah, Zay Flowers. Sure <laughs> yeah. Not too often you get three ACC football fans in the same room here. Uh, but wow. we are here to discuss the man, uh, Drake May. Um, first off, before we got to get into it, we got some questions prepared, but uh, give us your general breakdown of Drake May. What did you notice over the uh, year plus covering Drake May? Um, what's your general overview of him? Did, did we get a good pick? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, this is a very quarterback heavy draft, obviously, as everybody knows. And for a while, especially going into the year, Drake May was expected to be picked, you know, most likely second. I think Caleb Williams is probably the consensus number one for most of the year. Some people probably thought, uh, mostly, you know, North Carolina people, but even people outside of that, you know, they, there were things about Drake May, um, you know, that people liked about him going to the year. Um, when you watch him, uh, you know, you certainly do see the highlights because he is a really good off script football player. Uh, you know, some of the highlights you've seen, I mean, he threw a left handed pass when he was under the rest at one point last year. Um, obviously, he can run it as well. He's got a good arm to him. So, you know, he certainly has had his share of highlights. But I think the way that he's able to to manage the manage a game is one area that I think he stepped up in this year. Um, you're not going to see it necessarily in the stats. And I think that's something we'll get into. His stats weren't as flashy as they were the year before, but just, I think when you look at him on tape and the way he was able to manage a year, uh, ma uh, manage the, manage a game this year. Um, you know, I think that's something that, you know, bodes well for him in the NFL. And I think that's something that will probably help him make the transition a little bit better just because, you know, uh, as long as he doesn't put too much pressure on himself to, you know, make a highlight play, if he just makes the right play, I think those first few years in the league, that would be something that helps him. Um, but yeah, he's certainly a, a talented football player. And like I said, you know, a lot of quarterbacks in this draft, he ends up going, being the third QB, but being third overall. So that just tells you the caliber of player that he is and the caliber of player that New England believes him to be. Yeah. You mentioned he's a playmaker and, um, it almost stood out to me as a strength and a weakness that he was, you know, his playmaking ability in college, uh, that left-handed throw that you brought up, that could be picked in the NFL. It's kind of like some of our thoughts, right? Some of that playmaking isn't going to fly at the next level. Some of that playmaking absolutely will fly at the next level. And you can see quarterbacks play make in the NFL. So you know that that's a real thing that happens. Um, how do you think that skill translate, that playmaking in particular skill translates to the NFL level? Because with that, it's it's a lot of instinct, you know what I mean? Like, it's not necessarily, 
you know, because a play like that isn't something where it's like, oh, I'm going to throw it left-handed on this play. It's just kind of like if you see it and it opens up, I agree with you, uh, you know, when you have, you know, some of these, you know, NFL uh, defensive linemen kind of running at you, you don't have as much time to figure it out and, and things like that. So decision making has got to kind of be, um, you know, right there. And the stuff that we see Patrick Mahomes do, it's totally unfair to compare anybody to him. Caleb Williams actually got a lot of Patrick Mahomes comparisons. I think that was a little bit unfair to him. That's that's such a that's the that's the finished product of what he, you know, is. And he's just a special talent and then an enigma on his own. But um, I think when you look at it, you know, from the next level, it's just a matter of instinct and a matter of, uh, you know, just using discernment. You know, sometimes you have to throw the ball away. You know, sometimes you have to, you know, check it down to somebody that's, you know, right there. So those are things that I think instinctually will come over time. I think that he's in a, a Patriots organization that is, you know, in a little bit of a rebuild. But um, I think with Gerard Mayo being the coach, you know, there's some – uh, you know, cultural things that I'm sure that he can still, ins- you know, instill there. Obviously, he's got Jacoby Brissett over there. He's a veteran guy. So, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, areas where he can kind of learn, you know, when to do this and when not to do that, uh, you know. But, you know, it's something that, you know, it can translate, you know, when it needs to. But I think he has enough uh, – he has enough awareness, I think, to just, you know, try to make the the right football play, you know. And we'll see. And we'll see, you know, just how – especially in that first year, uh, it kind of carries over and translates. Yeah, that's – I mean, I, I like that a lot. And I feel like all Patriots fans over the last – like and through the entire pre-draft process in general, either did a lot of breakdowns and things like that on uh, on Drake Mayhem themselves, like myself or and Pete included. And there were some that were following, like, top journalists that covered the Patriots, like Taylor Kyles and – Evan Lazar and things, uh, people like that. But all of us have an understanding of Drake man, what he did on film. Mm-hmm. And you brought up that he had a lot of traits and things like that, that necessarily did not show up on the stat sheet and sometimes did not even show up on film. So what were some things when you were covering North Carolina football inside out, what were some things or some traits about Drake that were maybe shown at practice or maybe shown in the locker room that most most likely would not show up on a stat sheet or on film. That guy, he's a kid, really. You know what I mean? Like he's a like at heart, I feel like he's a kid. So um uh you know there was a, a story done um you know by Mass Live uh recently about Drake May. It was like this feature story uh and the guy's name is escaping me. I believe his last name is Mason that wrote the story. I I apologize the name's escaping me of the guy who wrote the story. Um but so as you know, most people know, or you know, as we know around here, Drake is the youngest of four. Everybody was an athlete, so it was a very competitive household. And so, you know, he was always, you know, the youngest, and he was always like, you know, quote unquote, like the smallest of uh, his brothers. Because obviously, uh, you know, Luke May played North Carolina. He's like six eight, six nine. He had another brother, six seven, and then you uh, know another brother that played baseball as well. So, uh, you know, growing up, he usually was, you know, like the smallest among them or whatever. So, but that like. I kind of, you know, childlike, you know, personality, the guy like and we talk about it on the beat all the time, like, you know, you know, pretty goofy kid, but he's nice. You know what I mean? Like he's a nice guy, like when you talk to him. But at the same time, I mean, he's a competitor, like, you know, he, you know, whatever it is, just wants to win it. I know he got really big into uh, uh, pickleball last year. So that was kind of a, a funny little thing, you know, before the season started. Um there was one time, uh, you know, and I wanted to share this anecdote as well. They had just beat Syracuse. I think they advanced to 5-0 and at this point. Uh, so they just beat Syracuse. And at this time, the draft order wasn't totally set. But, you know, everybody figured the Bears would get the first pick or whatever. So there was a Chicago writer there. I didn't see the guy. I don't know the guy's name. But I was told it was a Chicago writer that uh, ended up asking this question and having this interaction. Uh, he's asking him about, like, you know, some of the progressions he feel like he's made over the course of – uh, the year or from the 22 year to the 23 year. Uh, and Drake talks about uh, doing individual drills with uh, Clyde Christensen, who is the, you know, uh, he's an analyst, but he's, you know, like he works with, you know, the quarterbacks uh, in North Carolina, stuff like that. And he's an NFL guy. He worked with Tom Brady when he was in Tampa, I believe. And he worked with, uh, with Peyton Manning. So he was having to do individual drills that those guys did. And so Drake was answering the question and he was saying, yeah, the individual drills are that's the most winded, that's the most tired that I get during practice because it's that intense. 
And so the Chicago guy kind of challenges him. He's like, wait, so you're telling me that the individual drills, you're getting winded in individual drills? And Drake's like, yeah, it's difficult. And the guy cuts him off. He's like, man, come on. Like in a like a you know snarky way like that. And, and Drake just sits there like, oh, like, let me see you try them. Like, you got to come to our practice and, and see us do it. So, uh, you know, it's any, it, but it's anything. Like, it's anything with him that's like, and y'all had to put up the video. It's a post. It's post game uh, Syracuse. If you want to see it, um, but yeah, like it's it's really anything with him. You know, like he really uh, likes to compete. That's just kind of his personality. That's how he was raised uh, by nature and by nurture. I would probably say. Uh, and so that's the uh, you know Drake May and, and his personality. But like I said, like when you watch his interviews, I even went back and watched some of his like one of his training camp interviews that he had. I mean, like you see it. Like you know, he's just like happy to be there like you know that's just his whole that's his whole you know vibe his whole demeanor he was at the uh bruins game bruins are in the playoffs shout out the bruins mm. and the celtics no no big deal uh <laughs> but he was at the bruins game with our second overall pick polk uh the wide receiver so he's already forming a bond with them and they had like a, they had the audio or they were mic'd up or something and you're right he's an absolute like he's still a kid he's having fun he's out there yeah. josh and he was like man they really hit hard don't they at hockey like <laughs> football they have some hits but man these hockey players he was yeah he showed some personality and yeah. honestly the patriots don't usually let you see the personality of their players so it's also like what's nice to see that we're also as a team allowing our star quarterback or hopefully star quarterback mm -hmm. uh to come in and you know have a personality and 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 to that reporter you always practice harder than you play. That's like one on one, bro. <laughs> you don't practice softer than you play. Like, dude doesn't know what he's talking about. So it good was for Drake May for, yeah. for not backing down, right? It was an interesting moment for sure. Like, I wasn't really expecting. And like, you know, sometimes in those situations, like, you know, a reporter will push back a little bit. But I thought that was that was interesting. Oh yeah. And then the guy was like, you know, I've been to thousands of practices and uh, and first of all, shout out to the guy. I don't know the guy's name, but you know, it, it's it's all love. I'm I'm sharing for the sake of sharing, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. He was like, it's all know, love with you, but I'll I'll trash yeah, talk yeah. a little bit. He's a Bears reporter <laughs> for a reason. You guys stink, the Bears. Thank you. <laughs> Two top ten picks. Anyway, uh, I I digress. Um, but it is interesting to hear about Drake May's personality. Um, how do you think uh, he is in the locker room? I mean, the guys love him over there. Um, you know, he I think he relates to them pretty well. Uh, so Drake was an academic junior, but like on the on the field, he was a, a sophomore. Uh, obviously, in the COVID era, a lot of these guys have these extra years. So he's playing with guys mm -hmm. that are like, you know, 24 and, and maybe 25 even, uh, you know, but he really I mean, the guys really like his personality. I mean, he like he's like I said, he's goofy, he likes to crack jokes. He likes to do things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, you know, yeah, people especially you know at that college level and among that team and he also he was a guy that really um i mean he grew up a carolina fan like you know he's all about um north carolina even though I, as i'm pretty sure you guys know i mean he initially committed to alabama and then switched over and went to north carolina uh so i mean he's a guy that i mean he was really happy to to be you know just at unc and i think people really respected that you know obviously the fans did but uh, you know, even among the locker room and among his teammates, I think those that's something that those guys really respect. That's awesome, man. So before I uh, get into like my next question, I kind of I was thinking about I was talking to some of my buddies from college this week and we remember like one of the stories and I was just like, holy shit, that was Drake, man. So my senior year, uh, North Carolina played Georgia Tech at the Mercedes Benz Stadium. Mm -hmm. So we were there. Um, there were like some like tailgates out there and like an hour before kickoff. So we went to the stadium like a little early, got some drinks there. And by the way, like this is like not me generally. We were like a mm. lot of cocktails deep. <laughs> and Sam Howell is warming up right in front of us. And there's just this kid that looks like like in pads, looks a little skinny, looks like he has no hair. And we just yell at Sam Howell, Sam, why are you playing catch with a prepubescent boy? And then we were just talking about that like some of my buddies really and we're like holy shit that was drake man and man. now it just feels like that's my quarterback and i'm like so happy to have him but like three years ago i called him a preview best and boy so uh, but you have to uh, write yourself out division oh yeah i mean it, it's all it fun is, it, you say yeah. your senior year so this is was this 2021 2021 yeah i graduated spring 22 oh dang we're the same age that's when i graduated oh sweet yeah, yeah. Well, i mean speaking of that i mean um uh you know if we shared like the personal anecdotes my senior year was 2022 i actually played 
uh, an intramural basketball game against Drake May. Uh, it was like the last game I played. Um, we ended up losing the game. Uh, it was a, it was an interesting thing. So like him, his brother Bo, um, and he's the guy I was talking about earlier. Um, not not Luke, but but Bo. He was on the team for a little bit. Um, yeah, and then another football player was there, and like two other guys. Um, you know, so we ended up playing them, and we didn't get washed or anything. I mean, we lost the game, but you know, it was it was a, you know a good game. But yeah, but I mean, you know, he played high school basketball at uh, Myers Park in Charlotte. Um, but yeah, uh, I highly doubt that he remembers that. But you know, <laughs> yeah, we uh, did play against him uh, that one time. Yeah, I mean, I'm buying his jersey, so I really hope he does not remember me calling him that. But <laughs> So well, he's, he's going to see this, you know? <laughs> yeah, I hope he does, man. Yeah. Uh, but going back to, like, the questions and, like, what yeah. we were trying to discuss. So you mentioned that he became a better game manager going into his second year as a starter, even though that does not show up in the statue. The thing that a lot of Patriots fans would like to know more about was all the transition that was going on in UNC mm -hmm. football, going from his first year as a starter to second year as a starter. So Phil Longo, who was there, OC, left for Wisconsin to coach mm -hmm. under Luke Fickle. And he had to work under a new OC, Chip Lindsay, who ran it completely. Like he went from an air raid to more of like a, I would say like, I would say like a, more of a West Coast style college offense. Uh, so making that transition uh, in offense, along with that, losing Josh Downs to the NFL, losing a couple key pieces on the left side of the O-line, going from his first year as a starter to his second year as a starter. What was going on behind the scenes when all this was happening? How did the team handle it? How did Drake handle it? And how did this transition that was clearly affecting his like counting stats worked out for him? There's a couple of things. One of the things, actually, they were using – they had one of the best running backs in the country last year uh, in Amari Hampton. So yeah. Amari Hampton had 1,500 rushing yards last year. Uh, he ended up rushing for 15 touchdowns. Um, he led the ACC in rushing. He was, like, top five nationally. So a lot of that is you have somebody like that. Because Hampton was on the team the year before, but, you know, wasn't as consistent – you know, didn't have that level of consistency. Uh, they really throughout the year didn't have the consistency – the consistency they probably wanted – um, you know, in the running game in 2022. So, I mean, they had to throw it a lot. And obviously, you know, like you said, they had a guy that wanted to, you know, offensive calm plays wanted to throw it. Um, but now this year they had starting off more of a balanced offense because you had Martin Hampton doing the things that he was doing. Um, another thing was the Tess Walker situation kept him out for the first four games. So he didn't have his number one receiver for the first four games. He didn't have his number two receiver for the first really two games because he ended up, uh, Nate McCollum, who Georgia Tech, uh, yeah. former Georgia Tech, transfer, uh, yeah, transfer. He missed the first game and he was like limited the second game, and then he started to figure it out. And then he had some inconsistency later in the year, uh, you know, in his own right. Um, so you know, it was, you know, a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving pieces that happens sometimes. And then you know, at the end of the day, like that team started off six and zero, oh. so you know, it wasn't as much a problem starting off, for, you know, with you know, the offense and because they were, they were four and oh, Tez Walker comes back. They win two more games. They're six and oh, they had a home game against Virginia. You know, I mean, at one point when they got to six and oh, they were number 10 to AP poll and just optically they were rated one spot ahead of Alabama. So that was just like a insane visual for a lot of people because it's like, you know, you know, we understand that, you know, Alabama is probably not, you know, the caliber that it, you know, once was, but just the visual of seeing North Carolina rated ahead of Alabama was, you know, it was an interesting visual. Um, and then their season, you know, petered on from there. They couldn't, they, they couldn't find this consistency across the board. Um, but honestly, as far as Drake, Drake is, you know, when, when I watch him play, I will say, I, you know, I don't really see a guy that's concerned too much about, you know, stats, you know, I, I really do think he, you know, would win a football game. He'd be okay winning a football game throwing like 115 yards. I think he would be okay doing that. Um, Cause like I said, man, he's, he's a competitor and wants to win. He had no problem with Martin Hampton getting the carries that he got. And, you know, uh, so, uh, but yeah, I don't think the, the lower stats really impacted him, you know, so much and you know, or anything around the team or anything like that. You talked about the stats. One of the stats that I thought was interesting and uh you know his wide receivers and the amount of drops and and just their performances and what the stats could have been 
um, or, you know, not could have been, but you know what I mean? If, if there was a different set of wide receivers that were making plays for him, not just the uh, skill set, but like you said, there was a health issue at the beginning of the season. And interestingly enough, the beginning of the season was excellent. What did they win? Like mm-hmm. six, seven games in a row. And then they had the last, yeah. And then the end of the year, they had actually a losing record, right? So mm-hmm. when the wide receivers were healthy. So do you think the wide receivers were a factor in, factor in some of those stats? Um, do you think that that's a fair criticism of the wide receiver group at UNC? Honestly, I I didn't really think the wide receiver. Well, here's the thing that's, that's interesting about UNC. They have, so obviously Tez is an NFL player and, uh, and Nate McCollum, you know, he was a solid other option. They had another guy, J.J. Jones. He didn't create the most separation, but, you know, you know, bigger physical, you know, kind of receiver. He actually had a good first few games before Tez came back as far as, the, you know, numbers and, like he played well against Pitt and things like that, but you know, probably not the star that uh that uh that Tez was or whatever. But um, they had you know tight ends. They had a guy named Bryson Nesbitt who you know he was a really functionally like you know bigger uh yeah bigger receiver kind of situation. Uh, another guy, Copenhaver, even though he was actually limited a lot of the year, he actually played with like a a brace on his wrist like pretty much the whole year and things like that. Um. So, yeah, I will say they also, you know, some of these teams in, in college football, their running backs are pretty involved in the passing game. North Carolina's running backs are not that involved in the passing game. Uh, they don't do a lot of, uh, you know, guys catching out of the backfield or anything like that. So, you know, you're not going underneath to the same, you know, extent, kind of getting those, you know, yards after catch kind of kind of stats like that. Um but, yeah, I thought their wide receiver group wasn't bad. I mean, obviously the best one they had, Sam Howell actually enjoyed the best wide receiver group they had, really, because Sam Howell played with two pros uh, for more than, for multiple years. So they were able to kind of get a, like, a real chemistry down. Um, I guess that's another thing you could probably think about. Like, yeah, he had Josh Jones and Antoine Green the first year. Both those guys got drafted. Uh, then the next – and J.J. Jones was around, I believe. Um, but, yeah, he was around for sure. And then – the next year, his number one and number two are like two totally different guys. So mm. you could look at that. Um, I don't know that it was so much of the right receivers. I really think, I mean, they ran the ball. Like I said, they ran it a lot more, um, you know, and yeah, at the end of the year, they just, you know, the consistency wasn't quite there. They couldn't quite, uh, you know, sustain the the start that they had uh, to close the year. But um, yeah. Now I think this year, um, and you guys obviously know more about the the Patriots wideouts uh, than I do. Like when I was looking at it, it looks I think they're bringing their like leading receiver back and and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I'm so like, I'll break it down right. So we got yeah. um, we have a bunch of wide receiver twos. That's uh, the Patriots issue right now. We have Kendrick mm-hmm. Bourne, wide receiver two, not really a separator. We have Pop Douglas, mm-hmm. who had an excellent rookie year, honestly. One of the best rookie years out of a wide receiver we can on, we can remember in Patriots, you know, you know, last twenty something years, really. Uh, so super excited to see both of them. They'll probably be, you know, on out there every single Sunday, just roll them out. And then you got a, you know, another collection of wide receivers. Uh, we signed KJ Osborne in the off season from the mm-hmm. Vikings. Um, so he's a kind of a depth peeps piece there. Um, and then we drafted two. Uh, we drafted uh, Jalen Polk and um, Baker out of UFC. So those are two other exciting. We also have Hunter Henry at the tight end position, um, mm-hmm. which we're excited about. And then we got <laughs> Juju uh, Smith Schuster, <laughs> which nobody's excited about in Patriots Nation. We're actually <laughs> kind of waiting for June first to roll around, figuring that he's going to get traded right after June first. Uh, kind of just waiting on that to happen. To be honest with you, <laughs> nobody expects him. Uh, to really contribute too much. So we have a decent collection of wide receivers for May to work with, especially mm-hmm. drafting two young guys. Polk's uh, more of your safety valve possession receiver, um, yeah. although deep threat. It's kind of funny that we talk about him as a safety valve, but he's an excellent deep threat. Fitz okay. Jake May uh, personality yeah. and, and, and play style. And then Baker um, doesn't have burner speed so much. But he is one of the best deep wide receivers in this draft. Um, and he was taken in, what, the fourth round of it? Do I have that fourth right? Fourth round, 110th yeah. overall. Yep. Right. Yeah. Which division I were ecstatic about. We're, we both have him as one of our favorite draft picks at the Patriots select. I, we just kind of said, OK, we love Drake May. But outside of that, well, who's your favorite one? Because that's always the conversation. Like we, we're all in love with Drake May over here in mm. uh, New England. It's just, you know, when we were talking about the draft, we would always pick Drake May if we had to pick uh, who's the best or who we like, who we like the most. So but Baker yeah. excites us. So we do have some wide receivers um that are young but we lack an x we lack that um that burner so uh part of our our part of division i's thinking is drake may might not start week one 
Uh, yeah. You're likely to see Jacoby Brissett start week one, yeah. just so that Drake may can learn from the veteran, develop over time. Um, and maybe when it's time for Drake May season to actually kick off, that's when you bring in your burner X. It might be too soon to pay a guy $25 million something million this year and not be on a team that's expected to go to the playoffs. So um, yeah. the wide receiver is a concern. Um, but we have we have some promise is kind of, I think, the way I'll summarize it. Did I miss anything there? The one thing that I would add to that, I think you nailed the wide receiver portion on the head. One thing that uh, is going a little overlooked for the Patriots right now, uh, Jeremiah, you brought this point as well, that like UNC had no passing game to their where their running backs were involved. And we have the Browns offensive coordinator as our new offensive coordinator. The Browns last year, that 23% of their... Uh, passing targets when they're running backs. And we have Ramadre Stevenson, who is a good pass catching running back, but we also brought in a pass catching specialist running back from the commanders. We signed Antonio Gibson. Mm-hmm. So that will also. Kind of, oh, yeah. He, he's a PPR <laughs> monster. So mm-hmm. that is one thing that like uh, is going a little overlooked for the Patriots that uh, we will have our running backs involved in the passing game a lot, especially out of 21 personnel where there will be two running backs on the field at the same time as well. Mm. So uh, those things will help out a rookie quarterback, you know, kind of having a safety valve receiver and pull, kind of having the option to check it down to a running back who can go gain you extra six yards. So when it comes to both taming his play style and uh, helping him out with some easier completions. I do think there there are options available for him on the Patriots, so I'm excited to see that as well. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's something that's going to allow him to you know kind of stay around. Like if he can prove, obviously, even with those shorter passes, that he can be accurate at the NFL level, then you kind of look at the okay, this is a guy we can build around. Let's get this you know caliber receiver, or let, at least try to let's draft this you know caliber receiver because sometimes it's the guys that you're able to draft. Like, you know, I don't know how well, I mean, the Patriots are in a division that, you know, could potentially have three playoff teams depending on, you know, if the Jets can figure it out. I don't really know if they can, but I would say for sure two. Um, So it's like, okay, you see how this season goes. I'm absolutely, you guys brought it up. I'm a proponent of keeping your quarterbacks, your rookie quarterbacks on the bench if you have to, because, some of the best quarterbacks in the league right now sat the first year or didn't play a lot the first year. So um, I'm a proponent of that for sure. Um, And yeah, let's see, you know, if Drake, you know, kind of gets those reps, gets those, uh, you know, starts late in the year. uh, I don't know how, I don't know if he'll uh, be a day one starter. I don't know if he'll start half the season. I don't know exactly what their plan is going to be with him, but uh, if he can kind of prove, you know, that accuracy and, you know, ability to get chemistry down, if you get the right, if you get the right receiver, uh, then you can start looking into, you know, building your offense out from there. Um, I do think it's good that they're uh, that Drake is coming in when, you know, everything's new so they can kind of, you know, really start fresh. He doesn't have to feel the pressure of playing under like a Belichick or, you know, anything like that. Like he can just kind of I think he can figure his own way out a little bit uh, while also being in a obviously a good uh, organization that has a history and has a culture of winning. I'm interested why you think that um, since Gerard Mayo is the head coach, there's less pressure as opposed to if Bill Belichick was the head coach. Because Belichick has been there for – he, I think he got more than 20 years, right? Like it was 20-something. 20 24. 24. 24 years. Yeah. I mean, you know, and Belichick for a long time too. And I know Brady has been removed from the Patriots for a few years. But, I mean, yeah, like, you know, being synonymous with Tom Brady. So I was like, okay, well, Belichick did all of this with Tom Brady. Uh now he's got Drake May and he's going to do these things with Drake May, uh, you know, almost like a not to the same exact extent, almost like Popovich coaching Wimby in the NBA right now, where it's like, you know, the same dude that mm-hmm. was coaching. But, you know, it's kind of a different era. Um, obviously, Jermaine Mato is from the Bill Belichick like era. Yes. But uh, I do think there's a different because also Belichick was he's very stubborn guy. Like, you know, it's very my way the highway kind of thing it seems you don't say (laughs) yeah you know what i mean like it's that's just kind of how it is and i think like uh you know for somebody like drake again uh you know just starting fresh starting new uh you know i do think drake is more talented than like a mac jones was but at the same time i don't think mac jones that's not saying much jeremiah us patriots fans we have a very low perspective he was picked but his rookie year we had all the all the you know we were high on him right he had a great rookie year we were excited about the future and 
And then we trade him for a sixth round pick. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the decline is really hard. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that Patriots fans do put a lot of pressure on. You're talking about Belichick putting pressure yeah. on Patriots Nation. That didn't leave. Patriots Nation is still here. And I think part yeah. of not starting Drake May week one is if he had two bad games in a row, you would hear a lot of criticism coming his way. Like we, it, we do not have patience around here. I, Division I, we might have more patience. I think we hopefully can humbly consider ourselves a little bit more realist when it comes to some of these expectations of, of a young quarterback. Um, but starting him when he's ready is going to be really important given, like yeah. you said, the pressures. And for Gerard Mayo, I wonder if that's a factor too, being a rookie head coach himself, right? No previous real experience being a head coach anywhere. Uh, so it, his decision of when to bring Drake May in might make or break his career or also Drake May. So I'm wondering um, what your prediction is. Do you think Drake May starts this season? Do you think it takes an injury for Drake May to start? Or do you think it's more so let him get comfortable with the NFL schedule and the routines that go into the NFL and start him when he's ready this year? Uh, do you have do you have any bold or hot takes of when Drake May uh, will see the playing field in the NFL? Yeah, if I had to guess, and again, this is totally a guess, I think he'll start this year, but I don't think he'll start the first game. I think he'll start mm-hmm. uh, probably midseason or something like that. Um, you know, I don't know if it's – hopefully it's not because of, like, injury or I don't know if it's, you know, it'll be because, you know, Brissett's not playing well. But I think Brissett is. I mean, he's he's fine. You know, he's a veteran guy. Like, you know, he's – if he has the right situation, you know, he can win you a, a game or two here and there. Um, but I think Drake, I, what I think will probably happen, I think Brissett probably starts week one and then they, you know, kind of go from Drake May from there and just just to see what he can kind of do. Um, certainly wouldn't be shot if he started, if Drake started week one. I mean, they, they did pick him number three overall um, and he does have the talent and, and does have a higher ceiling. Um, so I wouldn't be shot. But if I had to go on record, I'd say, okay, he probably – doesn't start week one, but probably – but he'll end the year. To me, I think he ends the year as the starter. Division, where do you stand on the on the Drake May week one, middle of the season, end of the season? Where do you stand on that? I did change my mind a little once the schedule came out on Wednesday. So mm-hmm. I do think, like, when it comes to, like, the overall process that we were talking about earlier, I do think there's some merit in seeing that Belichick did draft the high-floor, low-ceiling guy in Mac Jones just to – Kind of make sure that, like, oh, worst case, we have the 20, 25th best quarterback in the league, but he's not never going to be a top 10 quarterback in the league. And that's what the kind of thought process went into drafting Mac Jones. And I feel like the process that the new regime has changed, Gerard Mayo, who's rookie head coach, and Elliot Wolf, now a rookie GM, is what they have done is they went for the high upside in this guy that, like, they went and drafted a quarterback number three overall, knowing that if they hit on them and build around him, he's going to be like he has the potential to be a top 10 quarterback, if not the top a top five quarterback in the league. And the smart thing that they did do with which a lot of like Buffalo made this mistake. A lot of teams like it happens in all different ways, like Chiefs drafted Mahomes knowing Alex Smith was going to start a year one. Yeah. Uh, Chargers drafted Herbert, wanting to start Tyrod Taylor, and Tyrod Taylor went down. But I think that is the right mindset, knowing you have a proven starter in the building or a proven, m- m- like, mediocre caliber starter, high ups, high end backup is what mm-hmm. I call Jacoby Brissett, who knows this offense too. He was on the 2022 Browns. So when taking that into account first so i just wanted to give some props to the new regime i don't think this would have happened under bill Belichick. that's essentially right. what i'm saying uh looking at the schedule now first off fuck you nfl for not giving us a buy after we are traveling to London. yeah what is that why are we not getting a buy after an international game that makes no sense so that pissed me off a little but look oh yeah thank you for pulling it up but yeah looking at this schedule I don't think there's any merit in putting Drake May in the first six weeks. Because out of this first six weeks, we play oh, man. six teams <laughs> that all have win totals projected to be above 500. Seattle is right at 500. All of the teams are projected to win 10 or more games. So with like New York Jets win total projection being like 9.8, which is essentially 10. I think there's merit in bringing in, bringing in him bringing him in sorry after the second jets game at the titans he can mm-hmm. get and happens he can go up against a weaker secondary 
I get the Titans defensive line got like improved. Uh, and they have Jeffrey Simmons on that D-line, who is a stud. But that is a weaker secondary that will, than what he's going to face for the rest of the year. Uh, he has an opportunity to go to multiple road menus and hostile road menus like the Jets, like the Niners. Sit for multiple division games against the Dolphins, Jets at home. Realize how a divisional atmosphere works in the NFL. Soak all these things in on top of sitting behind a guy in Jacoby Brissett who knows how the offense is working, bring him in against the Titans. Remember, last year, Titans did the same thing, that they brought in Will Levis like week eight or nine, and Will yep. Levis had that four-touchdown game. So that could be good karma against the Titans too. Just like give them a taste of their own medicine. Maybe Drake may throw us for four touchdowns. Hmm. But – after this is when it comes into like an easier leg of schedule d- defensively. The Bears don't have a stud pass rusher outside of Montez Sweat. That would be an easier pass rusher to navigate for a rookie quarterback, even though the Bears have a good secondary. There's holes on the defenses that we're gonna they're gonna face next. Rams have two rookie rookies starting on their D line in Jared Worse and uh, Braden Fisk. Uh, Both out of Florida State, ACC guys, by the way. Hmm. We go into this part of the schedule where the opposition's defense has more holes than the opposition's defenses did in the first eight weeks. I think that would be a good time to introduce a rookie quarterback. And going by that schedule in those five weeks from Tennessee down until the Colts, I wouldn't be surprised if Drake May as a starter can go two and three in those starts. If he goes two and three... In those five games, there's a little bit of confidence behind him. There's a little bit of fam- familiarity behind him. That's when he goes into a bye week. That's his opportunity to kind of reset, go into this last stretch of the season, and go up against a relatively easier opponent in Cardinals, and then kind of go up against like the big dogs, of the, AFC, big mm-hmm. dogs of the AFC when it comes to quarterbacks that you play Josh Allen twice and Justin Herbert to finish your season off. But that kind of also gives you, like Jeremiah mentioned, Drake's a competitor. That's what he needs to see to like, oh, hey, as a rookie, my team eased me into weaker defenses to kind of get me used to the NFL pace. Now let me see what I can do going head to head against like the best quarterbacks in the AFC. And then he, we will know what he has to work on in the offseason and where we have to build going into the next season. So I would personally start Drake May on November 3rd against the Titans. I buy it. I'm in. I'm in on the plan. I definitely don't think Drake May should start week one for all the reasons that every I think everyone else thinks, right? Uh, I want to see him work on some things. Some of the things that I would like to see uh, him work on um, or some of the criticisms that I have. I, I'd like to kind of get into the criticisms of Drake May and to see if they're valid or not. And the reason that I say see if they're valid or not is you watched him in and out, right? Uh, mm-hmm. if, if someone at this, in, this, in this room right here is going to know, it's going to be you. I watched... Uh, I went on YouTube and they have this uh, every single pass and run that Drake May did in 2023. And I watch every single one, but it just doesn't give you the same perspective because you don't get a feel on the game. You don't have you don't, you're not following them week to week. Right. I got to see it all in an hour. Right. So uh, here's what I came out with. Um, and, and, and a lot of it was, uh, you know, kind of it's out there. Other people think it, too. It's not just my brain. Uh, slow release time. Um, the other criticism doesn't slide. I mean, he does. He, I've seen him slide mm-hmm. on tape. But yeah. He likes to get hit, and if he's going to mm-hmm. get hit by an NFL players over and over and over again, he's going to get hurt. And when he gets hurt, we're going to lose games. Um, yeah. That's just how it's going to happen. So we can't get our quarterback hurt. We saw it when Brady got hurt. It was just not as fun to watch. You, st- you don't want to watch the backup. It's not good. Um, one of my criticisms that I wrote down is he doesn't hit the running back out of the backfield. It seems by intention, but when he does throw it to the running back, I see the running back turning to catch the ball. I don't see them gaining a ton of yards when they do mm-hmm. catch the ball out of the backfield. And that's part of our game. So I want to see him improve there and feel free to stop me. If I get to a criticism, you're like, Nope, that's wild. <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to need to cut you off there. Um, he's dealing with pressure a lot. Uh, a lot of young quarterbacks aren't, yeah. don't deal with pressure in the NFL at, 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 a, at a, you know, at a high level. Um, I see him rolling out left and right, and it looks good rolling out left and right, although some of his interceptions happen on the roll out. I think what he have? Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't. He had under ten interceptions. I, I forget the exact number. It was like seven. I think it was twenty. Yeah. I think it was twenty-four touchdowns, nine picks. 
Right. And of those nine, um, I kind of went through because I think it's really important to assess the nine. A couple of them were tipped off to the wide receiver's hands and stuff. Uh, but some of them were just horrible. Like they <laughs> double coverage way over the wide receiver's head under pressure. One was in his own end zone. One was in the red zone. Um, you know, some of those throws were just bad. So it's the decision making, right? Just what were you doing? What were you thinking there? And those criticisms, I'll admit, all can be worked on for the first eight weeks of the season, right? No make better decisions. Watch this game tape. Listen to Jacoby. He can teach him how to make the go through the reads, how to make the better decisions because he's accurate with the ball. It's not like he's, uh, you know, trying to hit a wide open target and just blatantly miss. I think he did that one time I saw on tape. Right, it was yeah. just wide open guy and he's just not even close to him. Like, what was that, dude? Um, and the and the commentators even said as much. A rare misfire by Drake May. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That everyone's yeah. allowed one or two, right? Throw him a bone here. Um, any of those criticisms not valid? Any of those criticisms uh, um, you would disagree with? Anything to add to the list? Honestly, those are things that can be worked on. I laughed when you said the sliding one because that's actually uh, – I remember Mac Brown – oh, man, what game was that? It was probably the pit game. Uh, when I think he hurdled he actually, the linebacker? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember I, that play. Yeah, he uh, – I think that was one – I think that was the one where we were asking him about it. We asked Drake about it at one point, too. It, it was one of the earlier games. I would have to actually check that. Uh, but, yeah, that was a thing of, like – Need to slide, you know. Uh, you know, I mentioned y'all, I'm a Ravens fan. You know, Lamar Jackson, he doesn't slide, you know, it'd probably be good if he did, you know, here and there as well. But I don't know, I, I think some guys just aren't uh naturally, they just don't do that. I don't really know what it is. I, you know, I guess it's because he's mind, tough, it's he's the t- little yeah. brother mentality, in my opinion, yeah. is that he's like, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna slide. That's like he's the easy way out. Yeah. I'm about to lower my shoulder, let's go. But yeah, that is wrong. Just factual. Don't do. Stop thinking like yeah. that, Drake. Go down. Drake, that is the right thing to do. And then Drake, somewhat to, not not really his defense because I do think he needs to slide. But I guess as a reasoning, like he is, he's a bigger, like he's six five. So I think to him it's like okay. But yes, he does need to slide. Um, and then you mentioned the the running backs out the backfield. Um, I do actually. I think that is probably somewhat personnel. Uh, cause they don't, I mean, just naturally, they don't really have pass catchers out the backfield like that. Like they just mm. haven't really, I don't know. I mean, like this UNC team last year and the year before that didn't really have that, but I do see that just in the sense of like, okay, especially in the NFL, like you actually are going to need to be able to, because with the pressure that you mentioned too, like, you know, when those guys, you know, get past that line, especially if you're trying to like run a screen or something like that, even, even something like that going to need to be able to kind of have that um the advantage he'll have in a screen i don't know that his, i don't think his passes will get batted down very often because of how tall he is um right. but at the same time like you do want to be able to uh you know be accurate uh yeah a lot of his throws are on target as long as he's making the right decision i mean he's he's an accurate quarterback i mean he really he's not high turnover which i think is good to see out of a, a college quarterback that he's not high turnover um i know recently Footwork was something that came up, so I looked into that yep. a little bit. Um, that is something that can be worked on. Uh, I do think it needs to be worked on some, just because, especially like in the pocket. And I think that kind of comes down to you know quick decision making, like you know know where you want to go with the ball, be able to just kind of you know decide right on right on the uh, right on the spot as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean all those things. I thought it was funny. One of those uh, shows, one of those talk shows, is making a big deal when Gerard Mayo said he has a lot to work on. Like, I would hope he has a lot to work Welcome on. The boss, he's, you know, he's a rookie, like you know, it was it was an ad, it was like a Fox Sports uh, one of them shows, like an FS1 yeah. show. Oh yeah, uh, no, we know all about it, right? Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Anything that's it was Plaxico Burris. It was. Oh, it was uh, Plaxico that said that? Yeah, Plaxico. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's not a surprise. Plaxico said something like that, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, like he's gonna have. I mean, I think Caleb Williams has a lot to work on. I think Jaden Daniels probably has a lot to work on. All a rookies do. On. I mean, they're it's rookies. just a silly statement. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're obviously. <laughs> that's that. So that's it. I mean, and they're fi- like you said, they're they're fixable things for sure. Um, I mean, yeah, those are things that you know to be a starter that you know you want to see him work on. But um, I think he'll work on them for sure. Yep. I, I I agree with most of the things that you guys said. The one thing I do want to say about the red zone interception, I did think when I saw it from a broadcast angle, I was like, what the fuck was he doing? Mm. But I got it was against Clemson. I got the all 22 angle on it. Oh, yeah. He was asking, I think it was Jones, the receiver. And he was asking he Jones to he was pointing to the receiver to ask the receiver to go to the further to the sideline. And the receiver took it 
up and out rather than flat and out. Mm. And it was just a miscommunication that he threw it like kind of flat. So those are things. But the thing that was the most impressive out of that interception that still made me believe in Drake was walking over. He just immediately ran up to Jones, already started having a conversation, talking mm. about the like his hand was on his chest saying something like, oh, I could have done this better or something like that. Oh, yeah. Taking accountability and fixing that in the moment was something that I thought was a good trade from a franchise potential franchise quarterback. Yeah, I should have brought that up earlier. Um, he actually is a – he's a big, like, self-critic. Like, he is a, you know – because, like, you know, we'll ask him, you know, especially early in the year, you know, he'll have, like, a couple of interceptions, you know, just, hey, take us to that play, what happened. So he's very – much of self-critic, you know, like he'll critique his own throws or, or whatever the case may be, you know, he'll be like, oh, I should have, even if it's one that somebody dropped or something like that, like, you know, could have, you know, stuck it on him better or whatever. Like it, that's kind of, that's part of the personality too. Like, you know, he's very, uh, he tries to take accountability for, you know, pretty much any play that he's involved in, like on the field. Yeah. So now we are kind of talking more about like Drake moving forward. So like one thing we talked about that he has to, kind of address is just his aggression and making the right decisions and one of the things was that a lot of us talked about like we talked about it on this podcast a lot of Patriots fans were talking about that Drake kind of needs to learn that in the NFL a five-yard gain on second and seven is a win for the offense not the defense which college quarterbacks don't always operate that way Mm -hmm. so that is one thing that is uh like pretty visible in Drake's game. And for me, that was pretty visible in Jordan Love's game coming out of the draft, uh, coming into the draft. And he was my pro comp for Drake May was Jordan Love, that mm-hmm. they're both aggressors of the ball that kind of need to understand NFL decision making. Both have a little erratic footwork, but both are just like, you know, that like playmaker or like playmakers, gunslinger type player. And then a lot of his comparisons by more mainstream media have been like Josh Allen and Justin Herbert because of like the archetype of quarterback and things like that. What do you see is a realistic expectation for Drake moving forward? Like knowing his play style, knowing how he operates, how he is as a person, who could be some good pros that he could model his game after? Yeah, I kind of agree more with you with the Jordan Love, just like, you know, if I had to, because I looked at I mean Jordan loves 6'4, Drake is listed as 6'5. Drake actually likes Josh Allen. Like I know that's somebody he's brought up like multiple times when people have interviewed him. Like he Drake is a big like Josh Allen guy. Um, you know, just based on hearing talk. And then obviously he grew up a Panthers fan. So Cam Newton was also 6'5 and he also liked to run it. So Drake's just not as built from like a, a muscle standpoint as those guys which i mean i'm sure he you know can like down the line but i mean he's already six five so i mean you know and he's already six five likes to run so um i don't know that he tries to mold himself you know into those guys later but i think as of right now like especially like as a thrower just like the, the tendencies uh not saying he's jordan love level right now of course but i do think that when i watch him it's probably a little bit more Uh, a little bit more of that than like, you know, a Josh Allen or or somebody like that. That makes sense, man. I just hope he does not operate the Josh Allen way when it comes to sliding. That like (laughs) Josh Allen to play 17 games a year, he's getting a surgery or two every off season. And I'm like, that might be where he gets it from, man. (laughs) Yeah. I hope (laughs) like there's no proof evidence in the league that that's sustainable that a quarterback's getting multiple surgeries every off season and still <laughs> playing 17 games in the long term. Mm. So hope, hope Drake's able to like tame his play style a little bit. I don't think he needs to like stop being an aggressor. Cause that's also me being a fan. I do yeah. want to see some aggression moving the ball downfield, especially as the receiving core improves. But I also do understand that his play style needs to be tamed. Mm. What about you, Pete? Speaking of, I mean, I mean, I I love his aggression, and it's something that we haven't seen in in New England in a while. And when I think aggression from a quarterback, I think deep balls, right? Like willing to take a chance on something. Um, we own Mac Jones is the most recent quarterback. Bailey Zappi, Cam Newton, none of them throw it deep, uh, really at all. Well, um, and and honestly, as as good as Brady was, it really wasn't like 
his strength. He was a dink and dunk, uh, more so accurate, intelligent quarterback. He had, mm -hmm. you know, the year with Randy Moss. He was launching them deep. Don't get me wrong. He had the ability, but we're not used to this throw it deep type quarterback. Um, Drake May is an excellent deep ball. We just drafted two rookie wide receivers that are excellent with the deep ball. The deep ball seems like where we're going. Seems like play action, roll out deep ball throws for Drake may once it's, once it's time for him to, to put the Jersey on, on, on Sundays. Um, do you think his deep ball translates to the NFL? And the reason that I asked that is watching his deep ball passes. They had some separation, like a good amount of separation. And it almost made me, my critique of college football is that the disparity in skill level is too great that you have wide receivers and quarterbacks that are going to go in the first round of the NFL or just to the NFL in general, going up against defensive backs who will have to, you know, go on LinkedIn or instead applying yeah, to jobs yeah, and, you know, yeah. go to work on, on Monday, on Sunday, you know, on Monday mornings and watch yeah. Drake on Sunday. Right. So there's that disparity and the wide receiver, did he just blow past me? Is that why he was that <laughs> wide open? And did Drake may an NFL quarterback just hit a wide open wide receiver deep? Or is Drake May nasty? Because I saw a couple of those where I'm just sitting there watching, you know, going through each play, and I'm like, whoa, or dang. You know, I'm just like, nobody's in the room, and I'm going, oh, man. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, myself, my opinion is Drake May has a, a really good accuracy on his deep ball, and obviously he's going to hit the wide open ones. Um, do you agree with that opinion, or do you, uh, you kind of have a concern? Will that translate to the NFL? Here's the thing. I – he has an arm on him, and it's accurate. So that's not necessarily the concern. It's just a matter of – and you guys obviously broke down the new receivers they have and who's coming back. So it's really just a matter of the personnel because Tez Walker had unbelievable speed to him. Like, I'm sure a lot of the, the ones that you watched that were touchdowns or that were big games were probably Tez Walker. So it's like that is – you know, that's a big part. Obviously, Drake's arm was <laughs> a, certainly a big part of it. But I think having a guy like Tess Walker and Tess Walker's you know, big dude. Um, so having a guy like that that you're throwing it to um, certainly, you know, impacts that. So can he find a target that he likes that he's able to get it down the field? And if he has that, it's not a problem. Like, it's not what a if problem he doesn't? at all. Because he doesn't. I'll just because, tell you right now, he does not yeah. have that target here. If he, so if he plays this year. Yeah, if he doesn't have it now, I don't know that the opportunities will be there, especially going against the NFL caliber, not even NFL caliber, an NFL corner or an NFL safety. Uh, it's just not not quite the same. You're going to have to find ways to be accurate uh, underneath or across the middle and things like that and then make them respect you enough to where you can get the deep shot here and there. Because, you know, a lot of the NFL guys, like, you're not throwing but so many deep passes in a game. Like, the ones that you do throw, you need them to at least force a PI or something, um, you know, but, you know, depending on how a game's going, you're not getting so many opportunities to really, um, to really do that unless maybe you're behind or, um, or you're just playing a defense that can't stop you or, or something like that. It's almost um, like a strategy, yeah. right? Like it's like to stretch the field sometimes, right? Like make them yeah. respect the deep ball. Like not a lot of offenses are let's chuck it deep 15 times and see if we can come down with a few, you know, there's not too many yeah. offenses. Yeah. I feel like run like that. And you, you talked about throwing it over the middle. And I mean, that's exactly what Drake May is good at, right? 94.8 mm -hmm. PFF rating over the middle. So if he has to adjust his game to throwing it over the middle, uh, being accurate, learning how to throw it to running backs, I think that he can do that. And then he still has in his back pocket, I can launch the ball deep. Yeah, right? it's, there. Uh, so I, yeah it's there, right? And that's what I think is important. It's He has that. But he also has the other things, too. It's not like that is his game. That is a part of his game. Yeah, I was watching, uh, I believe it was actually his draft Zoom interview. Uh, somebody asked him, like, you know, what's what's your go-to play if it's fourth and seven game on the line? And he said, yeah, I'll just go across the middle. That was, like, his, his natural mm. answer. So, I mean, yeah, it's something he's good at. Um, something you definitely want your quarterback to be good at, for sure. Because, like, on an average pass play, that's probably, you know, a lot of times that might be where you're going. Um, so, um especially you just need to kind of, you know, get some momentum going. Uh, but, yeah, so, yeah, he, de he's, he definitely has that deep ball. It's just going to be a matter of how many opportunities he gets to really go to it. Yep. And I do think, like, obviously, like, any quarterback that has a big arm, you just expect him to throw well deep. But one of the things that on film impressed me the most about Drake was his tight window throws. Mm -hmm. That threading, being able to thread the needle at different levels of the field. 
So one play that stands out is against Georgia Tech. It was a red zone play, or not exactly a red zone play. It was a touchdown play, but kind of from like 25, 26 yards out. And both of our safeties, the Miles Brooks and Clayton Powell Lee, are like NFL caliber safeties. The Miles Brooks was projected for as a sixth round pick this year. He just did not declare for the draft and came back to college for another year to kind of raise his stock. And Clayton Powell Lee is a sophomore, so he's not eligible for the draft for another year. But he will be like, one of those juniors that goes into the draft and still is drafted in like the third or fourth round. And against these guys, he threaded a perfect throw to Taz Walker for a touchdown. Um, and it was just perfectly threaded the needle between two NFL caliber safeties. And he made plays like that against, even though ACC got slighted as a conference, he made plays like that against top defenders of teams like Duke, top defenders of teams like Clemson mm-hmm. over his two years in the, uh ACC so that is something I see translating more than anything that and the numbers back these up his pinpoint percentage now that we have quarterback tracking for college these are numbers that stand out for me with his big arm rather than just like a true deep ball so aggressive for some people can mean that he can make complete that 55 yard go ball but I also believe that aggressive is on a third and 11 you complete a 20 yard pass over the middle of the field between two safeties and just nail it at so i think it's gonna go both ways for him more the latter with our receiving core for sure Mm. i think that pass might be complete the jalen polk in traffic Mm. (laughs) but uh i do think that his aggression is very his aggression translates to a three-way scorer than like a one-way scorer when it's just like oh hitting goal ball He's got the courage, you know, like he he sees the window and I feel like a quarterback that doesn't have the courage pauses for that half a second and throws it through the tight window and gets picked. He just sees it and rips it. It's just kind of like boom, boom, um, which is it feels instinctual. Um, it feels like he has the courage. It feels like he's got balls is kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, so I'm definitely excited. We're coming up on an hour. So uh, let's make this our kind of final thought, final question type uh, segment here. Um, you mentioned you talked to Drake May. Um that would be just glorious if we ever had the opportunity. So when your opportunity speaking with them, anything funny come up? Anything like weird? Anything that just oh, Patriots man. fans need to know? Like, give us something that nobody knows. What do you got? For us? That's a good one. Um, he definitely has his moments to like in press conferences for sure. I'm trying to think. I remember there was one where uh, uh, we were talking a little bit before the actual press conference started. So I guess before we were hitting like record and stuff and we're just randomly asking them, I think basketball season starts. We're just like, you know, I remember just randomly we're asking them about, uh, you know, like playing pick up Dell basketball with, he said he didn't get to do it like a ton, but playing pick up basketball with some of the like, you know, players on like UNC's actual team and stuff. It just like, you know, things like that. Um, I mentioned the pickleball thing earlier, uh, man, I'm trying to think if there's like a, a, like a funny you can circle back. You, you you can circle yeah, back can if circle you want. Back, yeah. We can let the vis rock, yeah. and then and then when we circle yeah. back, if you got any, anything the, uh, pops up. I thought the post Syracuse one though. That was that was the one that probably stood out to me the most. Like that was one like you know when I looked at you know kind of looking through it and just kind of reflecting on the year. That was one where I was like, oh yeah, like I got I have to bring that one up for sure because that was a that was definitely an interesting one for sure uh i think last year uh well 2022 before i got there since he was so new um there might have been more moments from that year um because i remember people around the beat kind of you know talking about you know how fun it was to you know kind of talk to him so i'm sure that year he probably had some um you know before i got there but uh but yeah i mean he's you know Pretty easy to talk to, win or lose. Honestly, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty easy to talk to for sure. For sure, man. I'm, I'm excited to see like having some funny, cool, cool press conference moments, cool like moments with the social media team. I'm excited to see like Drake off the field too. He seems like he has more personality to him than most of our quarterbacks did. I mean, Cam did, but Cam was there for like a year and also got right. COVID. There were a lot of th- that was a weird year uh, with COVID and everything, right. but. Uh, I have rooted against Drake May for two years because we played <laughs> every year. And lucky for me, I rooted against Sam Howell too. And for the last three years, Georgia Tech's three and zero against North Carolina. So are you guys yeah. beating us this year or man? It happens, it's, or? it's wild, man. Georgia Tech. Honestly, Georgia, you know, as a state, isn't kind to North Carolina because they lost football and uh, men's basketball in uh, 
at Georgia Tech this year. Yeah. Uh, the basketball one was crazy because they actually uh, they were on a ten game winning streak and they were they had an undefeated January too. So they got like yeah. the last few games of December, and then they had an undefeated January. So they would have had an undefeated month of January, and then it was right before they played Duke and they lose to uh, Georgia Tech. Um, we also beat Duke, by the way. We also and beat Duke. That was the thing. Georgia Tech beat Duke. And I think there was another big win that they had. We too. beat Wake Forest as well when they were. Yeah. Like, pretty yes, much. We, pretty much missed them out the tournament. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, you had Sam Howell, you had Drake May, and it's like, well, you know, this year, I mean, do you, you don't have those guys. Are you beating yeah. them now? I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I think UNC football right now, they're, it's going to be interesting to see how they do. Like, there's some guys that they're excited about. I think they – I mean, they lost some really talented players from last year. Obviously, Trick may be one of them. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that team looks. This one's at – this one's in Chapel Hill, but the last time that they played in Chapel Hill it was when UNC was 9-1, and one, and that yeah. was the loss that, yeah, um, you know, had and- UNC going by the wayside. So they started 9-1. This, this was Drake's first year as a starter for those watch. Like, they started 9-1, and one, finished 9-5, and five, and that was the game that started the losing streak. Yeah. yeah, and for those, for some people that did not follow college football very well that year, here's another Patriots nugget. Uh, UNC needed a game, like a game-tying drive against Georgia Tech. And on fourth down, Drake May was sacked by Keon White, another Patriot. Mm, mm. So a uh, fun little nugget there for those of <laughs> you that did not know that. But, I mean, I, like, UNC, like, as a fan base, like, I've, like, interacted with basketball fans, off football fans. Tar Heel fans are awesome, man. And I really appreciate you coming on as well. It's always fun to yeah, talk, like, right. it, like, drop in a few ACC nuggets every now and then. Yeah. But, yeah. Especially yeah. when they're positive about Georgia Tech, I saw yeah. they just smile when he was listing yeah. all those that's, wins. That's off. why. That's why I did not <laughs> talk about the Bowling Green game from last year at all. When we were twenty-one yeah, points, bring up any else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we lost to Boston College last year too. We beat my. Oh, we, we lost to Bowling Green, beat Miami in Miami, lost to Boston College, mm-hmm. and then beat North Carolina forty-eight to forty-two. Like we had, yeah, we yeah. set like the ACC record for last season in rushing yards in a game. I'm like yeah. this team has no consistency. I, it's, it's uh, yeah. a ride to watch Georgia Tech football, man. That was that was the crystal ball, that was the the crystal ball game, right? Oh yeah, where yeah. you didn't take the knee and we drove down in like 23 seconds. <laughs> that yeah. one right there, and just real quick, I'm just throwing this out there. That was I. I remember I came back after a UNC game. I don't even remember who they played. Uh, I had it on the TV. I have I thought about turning it off, but I just I just kind of left it on. I look up, and then all of a sudden, like. Georgia Tech somehow like has the ball. I'm like, what's going on here? Uh, well, no, actually, no. I did see that. I saw them not kneel it, and I was like, I had it on mute, and I was yeah. kind of confused as to what was going on. And I was crazy. It was yeah. wild. Well, Jeremiah, thank you very much for joining us. Like the Viz said, it's, it's absolutely yeah. been an honor. Um, let the people know where they can find you online and uh, what you do. Yeah, for sure. So my Twitter is going to be JX Holloway. Um, and so that's where you're going to, you know, I tweet my stories there. I'll like, you know, tweet from games, things like that. Um, and then if you go to at inside Carolina, that's where, on Twitter. That's where you're going to see, uh, obviously where our stories are tweeted out. The website is inside Carolina.com. So, uh, you know, that's where you can sort of check out not only myself, but, uh, everybody else on that staff. Uh, we really, uh, you know, do our best to, you know, cover that team, cover those teams that are at North Carolina, um, you know, try to get the best uh, information as well. So if you want to see how the uh, New England Patriots of the future, uh, you know, are, are doing at the college level, uh, this is where it starts, man. So, um, but yeah, and then there's plenty of Drake May stuff from the years. Uh, if you want to go check that out at Inside Carolina, man. So, uh, yeah, that's us and, and that's where you can find us. Well, thank you very much. Like I said, it's been an honor. Um, As we end every episode, uh, go Patriots starting forever.